All right, I'll just have a very short introduction. I'm Bob Pushkar. I'm one of the SCORE volunteers that, that uh, tries to organize these things. Um, most of you know that we usually hold these, these sessions live in person. Obviously, that's not happening. So that we've tried to schedule this webinar to fill in the gap and help our clients. So uh, thanks for joining us. We have an excellent speaker this morning, Sarah Olivieri, who you probably see on the screen. Uh, she's a former executive director of a nonprofit and has been helping nonprofits for years now with training and consulting. Uh, and I'm sure you read her bio in the invitations that we sent out. I also want to thank our Right Pat Credit Union sponsor. They've been sponsoring our workshops and webinars for the last few years, and we couldn't do this without their support. Um, and that's really all I have to say for an introduction. Um, sorry we can't provide a free lunch today like we normally do in person, but that's one of the limitations. So Sarah, um, it's all yours. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm actually in New York State, so um, this is a great opportunity uh, for me to kind of virtually connect with you um, in Ohio, I think one of the great things about this moment, there are some great things, is that um, everyone is pretty much the same distance from each other right now. Your next door neighbor or someone in another state. So it's really my pleasure to be part of your community today. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to be mentioning, I'll be referring to nonprofits, but I want you to know that everything that I'm gonna share also applies to for-profit businesses. So if you're in a for-profit business, this is totally for you as well. And let me just, um, I've, called, I've called today's talk, Pivot to Thrive. Um, how you can maximize your impact, reduce overwhelm and burnout, and make the new normal the new wonderful. All of you here are action takers, which I love. Um, and I, what is so special about that right now is that the new normal is still coming and you have the opportunity to shape what that is for you by taking action now. And people who don't take action now will probably get whatever new normal other people chose. Um, so, I am Sarah Olivieri, as you know. Um, I have been a former executive director, I'm an author, uh, and now I am focus on helping nonprofits change the way they operate so that they can really thrive. And I'm gonna tell you exactly what I mean by thrive later on, and I'm gonna give you the tools to get you started doing that. Um, so, First thing is, I hope everybody found the chat. You introduce yourselves. Um, this is what I see kind of with some broad strokes that are plaguing nonprofits. Um, one is plans are more of a destination than a journey. I can't tell you how many times I've heard nonprofits tell me that, um, and I'm gonna go full screen here for a second. There we go. Can everybody still see that? Okay, um, tell me that they couldn't start their strategic plan or their fundraising plan because they didn't have enough money to do it. They didn't, their plan didn't include what to do tomorrow to reach their goals. They were really a list of goals, not a guide to getting there. Um, lack of funding comes up, of course, as an issue again and again, and it really, nonprofits are left feeling stuck as a result of this issue and they're not sure how to solve it. Um, and again and again, survival mode, that overwhelm, burnout, I think people are experiencing survival mode a lot right now. It kind of overrides your ability to see big goals. And oh, there's lots of other things that kind of come along, but those are the three big categories. So I would love to know from you, um, are these true from your organization or is there anything else that you would add? Put it in the chat if there's something that you would add um, or if just a, a yes or that's, that's us if some or all of those things are true for you. So I'll give you a moment to pop that in the chat. Don't be shy. 
feel free to say that's not us. We don't have any of those issues. Oh, we have a very shy group. <laughs> uh, awesome. Poor communication with staff during this time. Yeah, I'm going to have, I'm giving you guys a tool actually that's going to help with that. Um, inadequate staffing. Mm -hmm. That goes, that's right with the, you know, lack of resources, lack of funding. Um, great. So my, I'm not able, it seems to use my right arrow to proceed to the next slide. I'm going to have to keep clicking here. Um, there's some kind of good news <laughs> is that it's not your fault that you have these things going on really, but you can change them. Um, uh, whoops, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but um, there's a fantastic TED talk by Dan Pelota. I encourage you to watch. Um, and he really talks about um, the history of charity and our cultural thinking around charity that really prevents um, organizations from having the opportunities that for-profit businesses take advantage of all the time to thrive. Um, and that is a horrible place to be in because it really, from the outside in, stagnates nonprofits' ability to do the amazing work that they really need to do. Lack of staffing, I'm seeing that a lot. We're gonna talk about that. Um, yeah, right now, people who have older volunteers are really struggling and, and we're gonna come out of that. Um, hopefully, uh, but I'll, I have a little, we can talk about that at the end if you'd like. Um, so how do we get out of a culture that is kind of keeping us locked in? And especially in this moment, we need to get out of these regulations so that we can move forward and thrive. And I wanna just tell you a quick story from my childhood. Um, my dad had a bit of a, a rough childhood and some things were left over from that. And they resulted in, we would get in the car as a family. I was an only child and my dad would drive and my mom would be in the front and I would be sitting in the back. And almost every time, majority of the time, my dad would just get really angry about something. It was, there was no theme other than that we were in the car and he would get really upset. And later on, I realized whenever my mom would drive and I would sit in the back, my dad would sit in the front, chances of my dad getting upset were much lower. And then when I was old enough to drive, if I drove, often my mom would sit in the front and my dad loved sitting in the back when I drove, nothing bad, no upset ever happened in the car. And I'm telling you this because while there were certainly years of therapy involved that helped other things, um, really what solved the car problem was we changed our approach. And all of a sudden we got incredible ha car happiness and it was not hard to implement. We just had to make a simple change of approach. And so that is what I want to give to you today is a different approach for thinking about how to run your nonprofit, totally applies to for-profits as well, that will really help you thrive without having, you know, without taking the years or lifetime of therapy approach, but changing the, let's change the dynamic so that we can skip a lot of that hardship. Uh, and so this is kind of like the version where you're kind of going through, right? You're pulling that rock up the mountain. It feels hard. There are a million obstacles. You don't want to be kind of fighting against, um, you know, all of the culture around charity because you're just not going to get there that way. Instead, you want to think of your, um, instead of carrying a boulder, maybe that boulder is a whole new organizational structure itself that will take you. Maybe there's another way, another approach all the way around the hill. Um, maybe you can roll that boulder down the hill. Um, so I want to give you some ways to change your approach today and make everything a lot easier. Um, I have created an approach called the impact method, and I'm going to teach you some of the elements of the impact method today, and I'm going to tell you what's behind it as well um, so you can get a sense. These are some of the influences that went into the impact method. Um, if you're familiar with Agile, um, Margaret Wheatley, who does a lot of work about 
um, understanding so new sciences and how they apply to leadership, open systems, um, great game of business. There's so many things here, OKRs, which are super famous in Google um, and Intel. Um, but this is just some of the thinking that went in. So if you're familiar with some of these and some of the stuff I talk about sounds um, familiar, you'll know they came from here. So to really make an impact, we need three things. We need to focus on three areas. The first is you have to have a process for improvement. You could call it your change mechanism, um, but it is the way that you identify and deal with issues that come up and adjust your plans. And right now, having a process for improvement is probably one of the most critical things. Um, and that's why I'm gonna give you a meeting structure that will actually facilitate your process of improvement. And I'm gonna give you a template that you can use with your staff as well. The next thing is an actionable strategy. You can't just have a set of goals with no way to achieve them. And you can't just have a bunch of tactics that aren't taking you anywhere specific. And finally, this is what I call your modus operandi. And this is your organizational structure plus kind of who you are as an organization. So who you are and how you're organized are very, very closely connected. And this is also gonna be relevant right now. For those who are dealing with lack of staff, changing the way you organize your team um, can be the key to unlocking extra capacity with the team that you have remaining and making a plan to rebuild your team in the future. So I kind of just jokingly put these together in the acronym PAM. Anybody who remembers um, Emeril, I think is his name, he was a chef on TV and he'd be like, BAM! So I was like, oh, PAM, that's easy to remember. So I'm gonna go tell you a little bit in depth about each one of these uh, and how they work. And I'll take a moment to answer questions before each one. So, um, whoops, am I out of order here? Process for improvement. Um, the first thing, I'm gonna give you kind of some good examples of a really effective process for improvement and some process for improvement things gone wrong. Um, so one thing that makes a great process for improvement is you don't wait for things to get bad. You just assume there's gonna be something to improve and you, to improve and you put it into a periodic schedule where you're reviewing periodically. Um, Valuing vulnerability. Brene Brown writes a lot about vulnerability. She's an expert on that. Um, really, vulnerability is about identifying where our challenges are and um, addressing those things so that we can become even better. And if we avoid vulnerability, then we don't have that opportunity uh, to improve in the most meaningful ways. Um, being proactive, again, about addressing things. Um, if you are proactive, then issues become opportunities. Um, if you're not proactive, if you're always reactive, then your issues are often challenges and you're going to get stuck in a very urgent mindset all the time. And of course, having that mechanism to, for change. You know, who, who changes, what changes, where do you change, when do you change, and why is change initiated? Um, those are all things that could go into a great process for improvement. Things you want to avoid are meetings that are unfocused, that don't actually take you anywhere, they don't actually improve things. Um, never looking at your data, that doesn't help you really know where you are. Um, only considering quantitative data, um, you, your qualitative data totally counts as well. Um, addressing issues reactively, and in for nonprofits, I see this specific thing is they over rely on their boards to be the kind of improvement change agent thing. And then there's a big disconnect between what the board thinks makes sense to change and then the reality of changing in the organization because it's the organization and that team who has to make the change. So the answer, the kind of a, um, 
the great news about a process for improvement is with a simple structure set of structured meetings, you can actually facilitate most of this process of improvement. It doesn't have to be a big complicated thing. Um, in the impact method, there are, there are no retreats driving this process. It's simple meetings that can actually replace your current staff meetings if you have them. Um, they don't take that much time and I'm gonna teach you one of them today. My next slide. Um, having an actionable strategy, right? So we'll start with the bad this time. <laughs> what makes for an ineffective strategy? Um, it could be a lack of tact or a set of tactics not tied to strategic goals. I see that all the time, especially in social media. People are like, oh, do Facebook, do this, do that, do Giving Tuesday. But no one ever really sat down and said, what is our kind of core intention here? What's our core goal? Um, and I'm going to give you a set, a goal setting set of templates that's gonna make sure that you don't have that problem. Um, overloading your plate. I see so many people building plans for themselves where they've taken on too much in any given week. And when we take on too much, we actually become very slow and inefficient. Um, same with trying to do too much as once. That's two, two ways of thinking the same thing. Um, having really big goals with no actions that can actually be done today because that's really hard to achieve if you don't break a big goal down into actionable steps. Um, taking months to build the plan before starting on it. When the world was slower before the internet, you could build a large plan over a period of months and then execute on it. But these days, things work so quickly. If you take many months to build your plan, it will probably be outdated before you um, are finished building it. Uh, and having a linear strategy. What do I mean by linear? I mean that your strategy um, has you kind of making incremental movement forward and you grow, you might, you might grow in a straight line. What you want to do is have a strategy that gives you exponential impact. So you get greater and greater impact with proportionally less effort into that impact. So what makes a great actionable strategy? Um, the thing I'm gonna teach you today about setting goals are that you really wanna get your outcomes, which are out of your control, separate from the actions that are within your control so that you don't get confused about this kind of action-reaction um, process of changing the world. Um, you want to make sure that all of your activities are really connected to achieving a strategic goal and that you let go of the activities that are not doing that. Uh, that, you know, things I hear, you know, people saying, oh, you know, we've always done it this way. Um, you know, it, it just seems like we have to. Well, <laughs> if you, if it's not illegal, you probably can and if it's not against your code of conduct then it very well makes sense to do that um, you want to have your strategy prioritized so that when something changes that takes your attention you know what to keep focusing on so people who had an actionable strategy that was prioritized before the covid pandemic they knew exactly what to focus on and that's something that i really want you to be able to do going forward um, so that you're more prepared for something dramatic to happen in the future, whether or not it affects just you locally or the entire globe. Experimenting is so important. If we only go forward with best practices, then we're never gonna figure out anything new. And most organizations I know are trying to do something new and hard. And so they need to be able to innovate and to innovate you need to experiment. Um, your strategy should also address capacity and impact, right? So those of you who are struggling with staffing, right? Your plan, yes, it should take you towards achieving your mission, but it also needs to help you grow your capacity to do that. And I think too often nonprofits are told you need to make plans to make your impact, but it's not okay to grow your capacity. And that's, you know, we have that conversation about is overhead bad or good? Overhead, or as I like to call it, operations is capacity. 
Um, and so that is really important to make the plan to grow your capacity. Um, and you know, just at the end of the day, this is true for for-profits and nonprofits. If you build your strategy around a love for your people, about feeling that you know, if you love your clients, you love the people you serve, and you feel because you love them, it's your duty to you know give them the best you can. If you keep that at the core of your strategy building activities, you will succeed again and again and again, and you will stand out for what you do. And the third piece is your modus operandi. I'll take a moment. Does anybody have a question about the first two before I move on to MO? Okay, if you have a question at any time and you want to pop it into the Q&A for me to address later, I'm happy um, you can do that so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. So your MO, right, this is both who you are and basic, the basics of how you operate from a capacity perspective. Um, and there is a big shift that makes a huge difference with the difference between a great MO and a not so great MO. So a great way of operating is to be outcome driven. And this is connected to my second item here, which is distributed leadership. And so the way we get distributed leadership is by changing our job descriptions in our organizations from a set of tasks that each person is responsible for and making sure we have a large group of, let's call them new leaders, who are now responsible for a set of outcomes. And if the tasks need to be changed in order to achieve the outcome, they have the ability, they have the power, the control to do that. And by distributing leadership and outcome decisions across our organizations, um, we leverage the brain power of more people in our organizations. And that is where the bulk of the untapped human capacity lies in most nonprofits that I meet. Um, we want our way of acting to be ag agile and oriented. What do I mean by that? I mean, agile, they can turn, you know, and make changes and they're testing out what, you know, what's working and making continuous improvements. But oriented, I mean, having perspective about, you know, what are we doing and how is that connected to a larger picture? Um, where are we in, in the clock of the world, in the time of now? And that's really relevant. Um, if your people are outcome driven and the world suddenly changes like it has, and it's probably going to continue to change a bit as we kind of resolve the crisis part of this pandemic, um, it's really important that you get your team focused on the outcomes they're accountable for so that each one of them on their kind of in their small world within your organizations can make changes continuously to keep getting the outcome that they need um, because the context of the world is changing. And it always does. It has just changed dramatically, um, but the context of the world is changing um, all the time. And so it's always relevant to be doing this. Um, being self-aware, knowing who you are as an organization, um, making sure you have a culture of accountability um, and a clear sense of who you are. If your organization were a person, you would be like, oh, they're outgoing and uh, maybe they're very, have a very strict moral code. Are they, are, is your organization Robin Hood? Do you believe it's okay to steal from the rich, to give to the poor, or is stealing just always wrong in, in the way your organization moves forward? You would never steal from anybody. Um, what is this is in opposition to? Um, and many of you may have this in your organization. So, you know, I don't want to say that these bad sides are so bad, but they're ineffective. And that's, that's the truth about them. And so it's really important to try to move away. So a machine model of leadership, sometimes called command and control, um, this is really left over from the industrial revolution. Um, it's about controlling people's actions, and it's actually a good form of leadership if you want extremely consistent 
um, results. So if you're making widgets, this is great. But if you're trying to innovate, this is not a helpful leadership model. But it is the model that many, many nonprofits and for-profit businesses have inherited. Um, the opposite of that model that I've seen in some nonprofits is shared leadership, where everybody is making decisions together. Now, boards are required by law to do this, and it's okay to have a small group of people um, have to do this. They're going to move slowly, and that's basically a good thing, but you don't need the entire organization to move that slowly and, and have everybody share in every decision. If you have had the experience of committee after committee after committee and nothing ever getting done, that's shared leadership um, being inefficient for you. Um, trying to brand without a brand. What do I mean by that? Um, if you try to do marketing, if you try to do, quote, branding, you know, having a website rebuilt, having a logo redone, getting your colors done, if you try to do all that without knowing who you are as an organization, that is the brand, that's the core of your brand, and branding is how you express your brand out in the world. If you try to do that without um, being in the, you know, without a clear sense of who you are, you're just going to get it wrong, probably. You're probably going to waste a ton of money. And yet, it happens all the time. Um, and just being 100% task driven. Um, and that is where we get that mindset. Well, this is the way we've always done it. Once you shift to an outcome based mindset, you will not have this problem because someone will quickly say it doesn't matter how we've always done it. We need to get the outcome. And so we're going to have to try something different because the always done it way just is not achieving that outcome. Um, yeah, I love arts um, has made a comment about uh, can I share art that um, Agility is lacking in many nonprofits. It's so true. Um, and many, I, I used to do nonprofit marketing in between running nonprofits and where I am now. And I partnered with a lot of really incredible for-profit marketers who wanted to help nonprofits, but nonprofits were not agile enough. They couldn't move at a consistently you know, quick speed to even be given these amazing support. So if you're like, oh, it'd be great if we could get some more donations, um, a lot of businesses would like to help you, but if you're not agile and you can't also move quickly, not rushing, but quickly, because when we rush, we are actually not moved. We feel, we feel like we're moving fast, but we're not actually moving forward quickly. Um, then they, they won't be able to help you even for free. You won't be able to even absorb their help. Um, so this is Pam in a nutshell. Um, and I am going to give you some exact specifics today of how to do this. And if you'd like kind of all the specifics, um, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Or you can talk to Art about it. Um, so with those elements I've just described in Pam, um, they will get you to make a much bigger impact and they will, kind, they will get you on your way to thriving kind of no, if you take any of those things from the the uh, effective column. But if you really want to thrive, then you need to optimize your new approach. So what do I mean by that? Um, and oh, and I, this is my reminder to tell you, I'm gonna tell you how to optimize your approach now, but I can also tell you I spent the last several years optimizing this approach and I package it together in the impact method. So if you want to skip reinventing the wheel and you want a simple way to just implement these things, um, I'd be happy to talk to you about that at another time. So how do we optimize? There's two main ways we optimize. And this relates also to how do we get nonprofits to be more agile. Um, one is we need to apply positive leverage wherever we can. What is positive leverage? Well, it's often something out of the box um, in, in any small circumstance, um, but it, a positive leverage changes are changes that we make that have a high upside. They get us a lot of value 
with relatively little or no downside. So they don't really cost us. So for example, I'm gonna teach you in this talk about the issues meeting. You can swap out your um, team meeting if you have a staff meeting with this new structure. So it's not gonna take you any additional time and it's gonna give you huge benefits. So that's a great example of positive leverage. And then the other thing we need to do to optimize is reduce drag. I happen to be an avid sailboat racer and we're often also thinking about reducing drag. Um, drag are things that have a very high cost with little to no upside. So on the sailboat, when we get seaweed stuck on the rudder in the water, it creates literally a lot of drag and has no benefit at all. Um, other things that have drag in the nonprofit uh, context. Um, so for example, if we have unnes truly unnecessary expenses, um, or maybe we have required expenses that get us relatively little benefit. So if you're required to pay payroll taxes, for example, um, you get relatively little benefit from that. Yes, the federal government is hoping, hopefully providing a return on that dollar at some point, um, but that's kind of an, um, an element of drag. So you wanna try to reduce unnecessary drag throughout your organization. Um, yeah, people's time costs, uh, costs create drag. That, that's a great um, point. And I'll tell you what I see in nonprofits is keeping an employee who is a bad fit um, for a long time is an incredible drag. And I, this is, it's always challenging to let somebody go, but I think in nonprofits where typically people are very heart driven and sweet, it is very hard to let somebody go. But the truth is it's actually usually not just a bad fit for you, but a bad fit for them. And everybody um, gets the drag alleviated um, if you let somebody go who is a really bad fit. That is probably one of the most expensive kinds of drag. Another kind of drag is just moving slowly. When you move slowly, and oftentimes people think we're gonna move slowly because we're not spending and so we're saving money, it couldn't be farther from the truth. When you move slowly, you miss opportunities, your, recur your kind of recurring costs of rent and insurance and things like that, they're still going. So it is very expensive. It creates a lot of drag to move slowly. Now, okay, so we wanna increase our positive leverage and we wanna reduce drag, but where do we optimize? Um, yes, we're gonna talk about actually optimizing all parts of PAM, um, and those fall into this first category. So you want to optimize your structures and processes. People always say to me, oh, we don't like processes. Well, if you don't like your process, it's not a good process. <laughs> so that's a great litmus test. If you don't like your process, there's, there is drag for you. So um, leveraging um, positive leverage in processes, one of the elements of, um, of implementing positive leverage is to make everybody love the process, build it so it's enjoyable. Um, so you optimize structures and processes by leveraging two things typically, if we're gonna take a broad stroke, simplicity and synergy. Uh, and by leveraging simplicity and synergy, you get efficiency and effectiveness, right? The larger our organizations become, the more we have to simplify our structures and processes because it allows everybody to understand them and everybody to do them. And then synergy is really, you know, it's as simple as killing many birds with one stone. I'm always asking people to give me a better phrase than that that, give, that says the same thing. If you know one, please put it in the comments or send me an email. Um, but it's, you know, one action, achieves many outcomes. Um, and that is a very obvious way of leveraging efficiency. The other thing that's really important to think about optimizing is your relationships, right? As much as financial capital is important, human capital in the form of relationships is probably more valuable in the long run. Um, and the way you optimize relationships is by leveraging trust, building as many relationships to the level of trusting relationships, um, which is a two-way relationship 
um, is the key to optimizing relationships. Are there any specific questions on that? I'm gonna go in a little further, but I can take a moment to answer a question if someone has a burning question related to that. Okay. So I wanna tell you, and usually I draw these arrows, which are why they're kind of um, funny, but I wanted to make sure I had everything set for you today. Um, how does PAM leverage synergy? Um, the way it does is when you have a great process for improvement, right here, you're actually able to make your strategy more actionable because it allows you to continually assess your strategy and refine the actions you're taking to make it more effective. At the same time, the more you're able to execute on your strategy, the more opportunity you have to execute your process of improvement and get even better at your process of improvement. The more we set goals that were the right goals, the better we get at setting goals. The more we get comfortable with identifying vulnerabilities and being vulnerable, the better we are at doing that. Also, the more we execute on an actionable strategy, the clearer who we are and how we're organized becomes. We get more comfortable in taking outcome-oriented action. We find ways to reorganize our team. Actually, in the impact method with distributed leadership, we let your team reorganize themselves to a certain extent, which is very efficient. Um, and so the more you execute, the more your how you, how you are, who you are improves. Also, the more you are clear on how you operate and who you are, the more you can execute on your strategy. So these are, you know, where are leveraging, there's synergy between those two, as well as um, your process of improvement and your MO. So um, the, uh, yes, vulnerable, I will talk about vulnerable. Um, the process for improvement, um, the more you improve, the more you take action and, and be vulnerable together, um, the more you will really gain trust and cohesiveness in your identity as an organization. And um, the more that you have the correct aligned team, that everybody who is on your team or involved with your organization it is in agreement and understands about how the organization operates, the more you can improve. So I mentioned vulnerable a lot. Um, I wanna make sure that that's clear for everybody. Being vulnerable um, means the ability to, at least in this context especially, the ability to bring up in a group setting or even one-on-one, -on -one, what is it that you're really, that is, is an issue or a challenge. Um, so it could be, you know, it's not just sharing a personal vulnerability, although it certainly could be. Um, it's being aware and open about your, not just strengths, but your weaknesses. Um, it could be an organizational vulnerability. Um, of, I think a great area where we see this is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think this is a very hard topic for people to talk about because everybody is vulnerable when in that topic. Um, people who have been discriminated against have vulnerabilities because they are vulnerable to being discriminated against. People who have been in privileged positions are vulnerable because they, they feel uncomfortable. They don't have the language. Um, they've, been, they've maybe tried to talk and been um, given a hard time or they've made mistakes in the past um, and they're not clear about what to do. And so I think that is one of the areas where so much vulnerability um, comes, uh, comes out. And when we have a really great culture of vulnerability, we realize that um, when somebody shares a vulnerability, um, you absolutely shouldn't punish it, not just because we want to encourage vulnerability, but vulnerability becomes strength. When we allow people to be vulnerable, when we create a safe space, when we certainly do not punish people for being, being vulnerable, then we allow ourselves to know and address our hardest, most challenging issues. 
And when your organization has addressed or is able to address your most challenging issues, you will be the strongest, most healthy, effective. If you're that organization right now, you're like, pandemic, we got this. We know how to be open with our vulnerabilities. Just to, uh, just to share another example of vulnerabilities, I know as COVID-19 was coming out, some people were afraid to share with their employees that they had it. Um, they were, people were worried about stigma around that. Um, anything with the word stigma, you can be sure that there are a lot of vulnerabilities there. And it feels counterintuitive because of our culture to embrace vulnerability as a positive thing. Um, if you're not convinced right now, read Brene Brown, but there are many, many benefits to being vulnerable. Whoops. Woo. Now what have I done? Okay, come back. Next slide. Um, so in the impact method, I've created a process for improvement, a way of building an actionable strategy, and a way of creating an MO that is highly optimized. And the way, the reason why it is optimized is because each tool in the impact method forces you to focus on what's really important and eliminates distractions. And I'm gonna go into why this is important, but first I'm gonna now teach you some of the pieces so that you can see what focus looks like. What does an optimized um, part of PAM look like? Because I want you to know one of the things about something that's highly optimized is, right, we have many, many benefits and you might be thinking, oh my God, Sarah, like, how can we do all those things? That sounds like a ton of work and we're struggling with the pandemic and um, there's no way we can possibly do this. Well, what I want you to see now, as well as give you some tools you can start using right away, is that when it's highly optimized, the, the gain is huge, but the work is actually relatively straightforward. Come on, my little clicker. Okay. Um, so I'm going to teach you two parts of the impact method. I'm going to teach you the process we use for setting goals in the impact method. And um, this is connected to our larger strategy making process. Um, but the bulk of the magic is in how we set goals. And I will send you when we send out the recording a toolkit that has these templates and also actually tells you how to put your goals into the type of strategy. Um, we do in the impact method, which is called an, an impact strategy. Um, so I used to be terrible at setting goals. Um, and I just, so I just, you know, like anything in my life when I was really was like, there's no hope for me. I'm going to dig into the nerdy science behind goals. And, um, and I discovered something that um, was such a big help. Um, that really there are outcome goals and what the academics call process goals, or I'm going to call them execution goals because I always couldn't remember what process goals meant. Um, and execution goals are something you can execute on directly. Um, so an outcome goal, on the other hand, over here, is a goal that you don't actually have direct control over. So um, I can't make art give me $5,000. Um, that's up to him in the long run, but I sure can ask. Um, and so that would be an execution goal. Ask art 10 times a day um, for five days in a row. That might actually annoy him. But um, just to give you kind of an example. Now, in the impact method, we actually break outcome goals into two subcategories. And this is not, um, this is kind of a new way of thinking. It's not that new, but it's helpful for um, creating strategies and telling you what the right execution goal should be. Um, and the reason why the way the arrows are pointing this way is because, right, when you do an execution goal, then you often get an outcome. So the two types of outcomes are perception and impact. So I'll do perception um, outcome goals are things when you change the way 
somebody thinks or feels. Um, so oftentimes, you, if you need to gain somebody's trust, that is a perception goal. Um, and an impact goal is when you change the way somebody acts or their state of being. So if you want somebody to give you money, that's an action. Um, and so oftentimes when we say we're raising money, it sounds like one of those execution goals because we say we're raising, but really it's an impact goal in disguise because what it really means is we're getting other people to give us their money. Um, and that is an action, an impact. Um, another way, another type of impact goal is, so let's say you take someone who was homeless and you get them into stable housing. Um, that's an impact goal. Um, and then oftentimes, I have kind of double arrows here, oftentimes we need to take an action um, to change the way people think before we can change the way they act, right? Change the way somebody thinks, and you can often change the way they will act. And then sometimes, you know, we'll be having um, execution goals that are, you know, both change the way they think and then also do something directly to get them to act. Um, and the other reason why we break these two out, besides the fact that they can kind of be in a chain, is that whenever you have a perception goal, you have a really big clue into what kinds of execution goals you need to set because there are only a few kind of disciplines or areas um, that relate to changing the way people think and feel. Um, and only some of them typically apply in a business setting. Um, so the arts. Arts are all about changing the way people think and feel. Um, and in a business setting, often this relates to marketing. So what words, what words are we producing? What images are we producing? Um, comedians, less applicable in the business setting, but comedians are all about, and you could call it lump them into performing arts, changing the way we think and feel. Um, therapists, therapy is all about changing the way we think and feel. Um, typically not going to be um, one of your execution goals. However, right now when we've had a crisis, um, it is possible that you are dealing with a set of perception goals um, for your, the people you serve. And it might make sense to apply, you know, set a goal of getting a certain amount of therapists available to help. You might also be um, dealing with your team um, being in a new situation. And what I found right now is that most nonprofits have um, had one of two things happen. One is that their teams are now working from home and that's new and they're making a big adjustment. And the other is that previously their work was not particularly hazardous and now it is. Um, so that is, you know, that has to do kind of with a context change. So um, for those, I know there was a question specifically about, you know, we had relied on elderly volunteers. Um, well, part of the answer for you is going to go back and say, now our work is hazardous. So what execution goals do we need to put in place so we can keep having the same impact? Um, but what do we need to change so that it is not as hazardous? Safety precautions, you might need to reach a new younger audience. Um, it might make sense to put people into kind of into shifts so fewer people on for a longer time. Um, those are some, some possible execution goals. So we want to be focused, right? So the first level of focus is to break your goals into those three types and always start with the outcome goal first. Don't pick an activity you want to do and then find the goal to match it. Set the outcome you're really trying to achieve and then create the activities um, that you want to do. So I'm going to give you these templates, but these templates are going to force you to set a clearer, better goal. Um, you're going to state what the goal is. You're going to just circle whether or not it's impact or perception. You're going to prioritize it, right? Priority is a way of optimizing. Um, and we have these very specific, um, sorry, priority and order. So priority is critical, important, normal, or low. If you circle low, crumple up your goal and throw it away. <laughs> um, so um, otherwise, stick with normal, priority, important, or critical. 
And this order for these, this is related to how we create an impact strategy. Um, but it tells us what to focus on when. So if it's something we should do right away, then it's something we can do right away and will actually serve as a building block for something else. A do next goal would be something that we could start now, but it won't be as effective until we get some of those other do first building blocks in place. And finally, anything that's build capacity to do means you don't actually have the capacity to do it right now, and you're kind of going to shelve it. Let it be pinned, um, and remember to build some other goals in that actually get you the capacity to do that. Any notes on that goal, uh, make sure you make something measurable. The whole goal does not have to be measurable. These are different than SMART goals in that sense, but how do you define success? How will you know when it's going to be done? Is there some sort of benchmark? And who is accountable? If no one's accountable, probably it will be forgotten about. Execution goals are very similar. You're going to go through um, the same type of things. Um, <clears throat> And then what you're going to do here is write what are the, the task lists, not all the small tasks, but the, you know, the high level list items that you're going to need to do in order to achieve this goal. So if you're going to make, um, you know, let's say you're looking for new volunteers to run your program because you can no longer use seniors because it's more hazardous. Well, let's say your goal um, is to you know, create an outreach campaign, right? The impact would be to engage, um, you know, 60 new volunteers. The execution goal would be to start a recruitment campaign and the action sets would be all the things you'll need to do in order to um, execute on that recruitment campaign. You're getting these templates along with written instructions, so don't worry about that. Um, I would love for you to just take a moment to try this right now, you can put it in chat um, and I'd be happy to review, but share one impact goal. It's a fine time to be wrong. I'll be happy um, to help you get clarity on this, but what's one impact goal that you have or you think you need to have and one corresponding execution goal. And then you can also do a perception goal and a corresponding execution goal. And this is a great way that you can um, share something uh, that you're thinking about right now, and I can offer you some on-the-spot coaching um, if you'd like. Okay, awesome. Raise membership by a certain number of dollars, or rip membership dollars by 50%. Awesome. That's an impact goal. You got it. Um, a way to bring in income, that would be the impact goal, and make virtual events, that would be the execution goal. Um, I would say a warning about virtual events, which are, everybody's talking about, is um, if you want to bring in income um, and you're using now virtual digital fundraising, digital fundraising, also you could call it virtual fundraising, has been around for a while. So rather than just assume you're going to translate your in-person activities, kind of make a direct translation to an online version, it's time to step back and look at the world of digital fundraising where they've already figured out a lot of kind of best practices and great places to start and think about what they're doing. Um, and I can give you a cheat. <laughs> it's not a cheat. I love it. If I know the answer, I'm going to give you the answer. Um, and the answer is um, raising, you know, increasing your individual donor pool um, rather than trying to do a big event has a, a greater efficient fundraising efficiency and will actually be really good for you in the long run. Um, reopen to walk in clients. That would be. Um, an execution goal and uh, less risk for volunteers. That's kind of almost a great, I'd say um, reduce risk is also an execution goal. So it sounds like, um, uh, well, actually reopen is probably an impact goal at this point, right? Especially because we have laws saying, um, you know, it, there's a lot of things that you don't have control over to reopen. So your impact goal, right, would be reopen and um, your execution would be less risk for volunteers. And maybe there's some other things too. You might have two or three execution goals connected to any particular 
um, impact or perception goal. How do I use changing social distance in childcare? Um, that is a tricky one. I'm actually working with a child care council right now, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with them. Or if you have your local child care council, um, they have all of the guidelines on that. Um, recruit volunteers with lower risk, right? So recruiting volunteers, so getting more volunteers, that's how I would phrase it, would be the impact goal. And one of the execution goals you'll have would be to reduce risk. Um, increase park visitor safety by utilizing ODNR YouTube videos on website and Facebook. So Rick, take me back. What's your impact goal? Why do you want to increase park visitor safety? Is it because you want to, in the end, um, increase total number of visitors? Are you um, reducing risk? What is, what's behind that one? Take it a level deeper. Impact goal, replace lost donations with new income stream. Great. Execution goal, mount online campaigns, find new donors, explore alternative, alternative options to donations. So I think that's great. I would just say the find new donors. Find new donors is really an impact goal. Um, uh, the campaign um, about talking to new donors or where you're going to look um, would be the execution goal. Um, awesome. Terry, send me an email. Um, you probably have my email. We'll make sure it goes out. Um, and I'll be happy to, um, I'll put it in the chat too. It's Sarah at pivotground.com. Um, okay. Yeah. Reducing risk. So think about that. Um, I suspect though, Rick, that there is still, um, an element of you wanting to, um, increase the number of people who can visit and be safe at the same time. We're assuming that safety is a general um, requirement. Okay, um, excellent. You guys are definitely getting these. So as I said, you're gonna get those templates. The other thing I wanna teach you about quickly is um, how to hold better meetings. And there's a meeting called an issues meeting. And um, I'm gonna give you the template for that. Um, but first, the reason why this meeting works so well is because it's about thinking. And this is a quote from Margaret J. Wheatley. Um, in our frenzy to make things happen, and I think a lot of people are in a frenzy right now, to take action, we've devalued thinking and often view it as an impediment to taking action. And in fact, what we need to be doing is creating space, especially right now, for our teams to come together and think together and understand what's going on and create, identify possible solutions to that. So um, just very quickly, I can do a whole training on this alone, um, but the basic instructions are in the template I'm going to give you, but it's called an issues meeting. You can do it um, weekly, you can do it twice a week if you need to. I would allot between an hour and an hour and a half of time to this type of meeting, um, but it would not go over an hour and a half. If you're getting to an hour and a half, definitely end on time and um, schedule, if you have a ton of issues, schedule a second meeting during the week and do that consistently until you only need one. Um, it, has a very, it is a simple standing structure. Um, just a couple minutes, you're gonna do a segue activity to bring the group together. Um, you're going to uh, share some headlines from the organization. Headlines are not announcements. I'm gonna repeat that. Headlines are not announcements. Headlines are about sharing key data that um, has either had some sort of change, either it jumped or it went down or you've been trying to stabilize it and you have an indication that it's stable. That can be qualitative data, so a story um, that in shares data, or it could even be a gut feeling that's totally relevant, um, or it can be quantitative, so some, some numbers that you typically track. You want to make sure you give everybody the opportunity to bring up any other issues, and then the bulk of the meeting, like 80% of the time, is about you're going to prioritize the most important issue on that list, and then you're going to get really deep to understand what is the core of that issue, and then as a group, again, you're gonna identify a solution and assign somebody, they're gonna end up on the to-do list to implement the solution. Um, so the real key here 
is to prioritize your issues before you discuss them. When you discuss your headlines, issues will come up and people's natural tendency will be to start discussing them. That's how you know you've caught a really good issue. And it is everybody's job in the meeting, and certainly if you have a facilitator, um, to interrupt that person or they can interrupt themselves and say, it sounds like we have an issue and put it on the list and do not discuss it any further until its turn is up in priority order. What you will find when you do this is your issue list is going to shrink faster than you even address issues. Because by addressing the most high priority issues first, Oftentimes, other issues on that list were symptoms of a higher priority issue. And so they will actually just resolve themselves and you won't even have to discuss them. So this is exactly the kind of meeting you can replace your team meetings with. If you've just started working from home, these are really critical. I would be doing these at least twice a week if you're working from home. Um, and also if you're dealing with you know, those hazardous conditions and you're trying to figure out, that is a big change to make. Um, and we're at a time where not only are conditions now hazardous, but the things we need to make them less hazardous, uh, the easy things are not necessarily available. So um, you're gonna get the template to that. It's fully editable in a um, Google doc. You can download it as a Word doc um, and use it for your team. Now, I'm back to this slide about where to optimize. So everything we talked about are about optimizing structures and processes, right? We have highly focused, highly structured goal setting, which really makes optimized goals and plans. And we have highly structured focused meetings that allow us to have an optimized way to bring our team together and think together. But there's one more thing, and you might be going, but Sarah, we're almost out of time. How can we even get to optimizing relationships? Well, I have good news for you. Because what do we say to optimize relationships? You need to build trust. Well, everything we did to optimize our systems and processes was about focus, right? We were focusing. When you focus, you get not perspective, you get clarity. When you focus, the outcome is clarity. Once you have clarity, you can get perspective on what you're doing and the bigger picture, the context that it falls in. And once you have perspective, you will be able to nab what right now is probably the most high value thing you could be feeling as an organization is certainty. Um, you will gain certainty because you'll know where you stand in the larger context. That's the perspective piece. And once you are certain, you will gain people's trust. They will trust you and in turn, you will be able to trust them and count on them. So we don't actually have to do a whole bunch of extra things to leverage, um, to optimize our relationships because if we're optimizing our systems and processes by using focus, we will also get optimized relationships as a byproduct. So when you have focus, clarity, perspective, certainty, and trust in all aspects of your organization, then you will thrive without overwhelm or burnout, even now in the middle of a pandemic. And it's especially important now. Um, so this is where I'm going to close. This is, this is real me. That's my dad in the background. That's my son. And my dad and I are teaching my son how to sail. My dad and I sail. We race together. Um, we have such a great, close, positive, easy relationship. Um, these days. And people always say to me, oh, Sarah, he must have been such an easy dad growing up, um, which wasn't really the case. But we did change our approach. And we enjoy such an incredible relationship as a result. And it really, in the end, was not hard to change our approach. And so I'll leave you just with a word of encouragement. And then I'm happy to answer questions is, you know, all you have to do is be brave enough to change your approach because it's not expensive, it's not time consuming, and it's not complicated. And the benefits are absolutely enormous. Thank you. So I see we have um, a question in the Q&A. Um, oh, and also, you know, so your SCORE mentors are here for you. 
they can help you implement these kinds of things. Um, and uh, if you're specifically interested in learning the impact method locally, um, definitely reach out to Art. Um, he's gonna be kind of taking up the lead to see if people are interested in learning the impact method through SCORE. Um, but many of these things um, that I have shared, um, your SCORE mentors can at least get you um, optimized in some areas um, because these are not totally new things. These are tried and true um, ideas and it's about getting them all packaged together in a way that's simple enough to implement everything. And your mentors know this. So um, reach out to your mentors and especially um, reach out to Art if you'd like to implement the impact method, which is geared um, very strongly to deal with some of the specific things nonprofits struggle with, um, but also will work very effectively for for profits. Now my question window is not opening, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second so I can get it to open. There we go. Melissa asked, um, increase larger donation participation. Um, we have a ton of small donors. Um, I think a lot of people are asking um, questions about uh, you know, increasing fundraising right now with donors and larger donors because it's so important right now. Um, because you know, charity giving is actually up but we're also experiencing economic challenges, which means each individual gift might be down. And that says you need to increase your total pool of donors. Um, so probably it's not the time where you're gonna be able to convert your smaller donors incrementally into larger donors um, because they're probably just not in that position right now. So you wanna add more smaller don donors and you wanna think about those people who are not hurt right now, go after some new major gifts. So it's called major gifts. You want, if you're Googling about how to do this, you wanna look up major gifts um, and you wanna be reaching out to some larger donors. They are there. Um, one of the big difference with larger donors, major gifts donors is in addition to the positive emotional experience they gain from giving, they view giving um, partly as an investment. So um, they're gonna have a slightly different mindset and a different approach to the kind of um, relationship and information they're gonna wanna have from you. Um, but generosity is up. And actually one of the um, things that's happened as a result of the stock market fluctuating um, is some wealthy people who are heavily invested in the stock market have divested in the stock market. They've taken their money out temporarily to wait out all the fluctuations and they have cash sitting around. And I've definitely heard some of these people are ready to give from those piles of cash, which are not currently invested. Um, so this is helpful. Terry, thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? Or Art or Bob, do you wanna add anything in? Uh, well, from my standpoint, I would really like to thank everybody who came. And um, I think it was a, an excellent um, presentation. And I've looked at the um, impact method with Sarah and uh, listen to some of her other webinars. And I would really like to uh, work with some people in the Dayton area on it. And uh, she is, is uh, offered to help support that. So uh, I would encourage anybody who does have an interest in it, go to Sarah's site and uh, look up a little bit more about it. We've only covered a small portion of the total here, but she has some tremendous tools and thing I like about it is that it's, I think it's truly doable. As you can tell, she's got very practical methods and it's not something you have to learn on your own. We can walk you through that. So, um, you know, th that's important. And uh, we are going to do a, a survey today and we're considering uh, additional online presentations like this, either by our group or reaching out to people like Sarah. So, um, I've launched the survey. <laughs> okay, uh, absolutely. Just, just figure I'd segue right to it. But, but anyhow, again, hopefully everybody found this as worthwhile as our workshops. I think it fits the quality and the content that, that we strive for in person. So um, if, if you want more, please, please let us know. And we appreciate your, your ongoing support. And I, I want to reiterate what Sarah said. I believe that there are people who are looking at their 
financial situation right now and want to help uh, do better and, and do it through local organizations rather than through Washington. So I would encourage you to step up uh, fundraising at this point in time and, and maybe target some of those larger donations that you may not have seen in the past. Thanks again.